Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 225 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Courageously Vulnerable, an interview with Crystal Hefner. My name is Richard Johanneson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. Matt, this is a really cool interview, and I think our community is going to enjoy learning about how Crystal Hefner did not initially follow her intuition or her body signals, which put her in a vulnerable position. She did not recognize the challenges that she created for herself by living in a mold-infested castle, as well as having breast implants. And more importantly, she didn't realize that she could shortcut her journey until she started to begin to model other people who had been successful in their Lyme disease journeys. Which I couldn't agree more. The part that makes Crystal's story so powerful is the fact that she treated with many of the world's top Lyme doctors, but yet was only successful because she kept researching and following her own signals her body was sending her. Crystal had to address various other things going on in her body, to allow her body to finally heal from Lyme disease. And she found and treated those things and is now on track to getting into remission. So Matt, we've known that antibiotics are a really important tool in a Lyme disease journey, but we've also recognized that if your body isn't prepared to begin the Lyme disease battle itself, meaning if your immune system cannot take over the battle, you're not going to heal. And that's one of the really important lessons that we've learned here from Crystal Hefner. So Matt, without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce to our community, Crystal Hefner. Hey, Crystal Hefner, and welcome to the Tick Bootcamp podcast. Hi, thank you both for having me. We're really excited to have you on the podcast. And, you know, there are a lot of celebrities that have Lyme disease, and, and we, we are certainly never critical of anyone who would be triggered by talking about their journey and therefore not as active in the community as we would sometimes want them to be. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're one of the folks who have used your platform probably more than anyone else to bring awareness to this. We want to begin by thanking you for being kind enough oh. to being so active in this community and, and bringing as much awareness as you are to this community. So thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, try it. I want to try harder and keep uh, getting the word out. So thank you. All right. So let's uh, let's make that next step in your getting the word out this podcast. Yeah. So Crystal, talk to us about uh, what it was like to grow up in Arizona, or at least that portion of your life where you were, um, you know, I guess a desert gal. <laughs> oh, well, I wasn't a desert gal for long. So my parents, um, my parents are British and they wanted to have me in America. So I'd be a citizen because they eventually wanted to come back. Um, so I was born in Lake Havasu, Arizona. My mom wanted to have me there because there's a replica of the London Bridge. <laughs> so oh, cool. uh, so um, my early childhood was spent kind of more in England. Okay. Uh, yeah. But from and there, I moved. Like? <laughs> it was rainy and overcast all the time. I would always, you know, get cold as a kid because, you know, it's just always rainy and damp. So coming to America was really nice. We... Um, came to San Diego and San Diego is such a great place to grow up. And then at 21, I came to Los Angeles. So Southern California, mostly. So I understand your dad uh, is a musician. And, and so talk to us about what it was like to grow up the child of a musician. It was, it was nice. It was fun. It was great to go to his shows and just hang out as a kid. And I, you know, I really idolized him and so did a lot of other people. So it, it was really fun. So clearly the uh, the artistic genes were were strong because they rolled over into uh, Crystal Hefner and you've been an entertainer for a good portion of your career. Um, now, I, I understand now you're currently working as a travel blogger and I want to spend some time talking about that a little bit later. I'd like to focus on the early portions of your career. So talk to us about what drove you into the entertainment industry and when did you first start to feel the, the, the artistic um, genes that your parents passed on to you? Gosh, well, you know, I, I came into the industry as a model and I entered into the Playboy world. So I met Hugh Hefner in 2008, and that was kind of my foray into entertainment and celebrity and Hollywood. Um, and it, it was fun. It was exciting. You know, there's definitely ups and downs, which I learned along the way. But but yeah, it was you know, it was it was nice to be a part of and I ended up parlaying that into other things like real estate and travel. And so now I'm, I'm doing those things full time. So uh, we do have to spend a couple of minutes uh, focusing on you, Hefner. He's one of, uh, you know, America's greatest icons. Um, so how did you meet him and how did you begin, um, you know, your relationship with him? I met him at a Halloween party in 2008 and 
you know, we started talking, he asked me, you know, what I did. And I said, oh, you know, I'm at San Diego state. I'm a psychology major. Then he told me he was a psychology major at the university of Illinois. And, you know, it kind of took off from there and I ended up moving into the mansion and, you know, into that lifestyle, which, which like I mentioned had its ups and downs, you know, Hef was, was a great person, but at the same time, there was a lot of rules and, um, not, you know, I ended up not being able to be kind of, I was kind of more living for somebody else in somebody else's life eventually. And I think that kind of, uh, didn't help me for when I got sick. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would think that those types of stresses would be difficult, but of course it was, there was a lot to learn while you were there as well. And I'm sure that has served you well in your career as an entertainer. So talk about some of the other things you've done in the entertainment industry. You were, uh, you were on uh, various television programs. You were a designer um, and um, and a, and also a um, a TV. I'm sorry, model. So talk to us about you know your acting, your modeling, your your designing. I mean, you 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 have this diverse array of artistic talents. I'd like you to explore some of that with us. Sure. Yeah. I mean, at first, you know, I had a lot of fun. I created a bikini line. I created a clothing line that was kind of more loungewear. Um, cause I noticed going to all these parties and getting all dressed up that it really wasn't my, <laughs> you know, like I liked things more relaxed, more, um, more comfortable. So I did end up with the, the loungewear line. Um, I got into real estate while I was at the mansion, you know, the, the, the money that I was making from modeling and, um, the clothing lines, I would just turn into buying houses. Um, I would also do appearances as a playmate. And I would show up to these appearances. And I'm like, okay, I show up and take pictures with people, but you know, I need to bring some kind of talent. So I learned how to DJ. And from there, I ended up with the residency at the Hard Rock in Las Vegas at their rehab pool parties. So, you know, I had a lot of fun, but, but it definitely started slowing down. <laughs> so let's talk about first, uh, when you first started to notice the symptoms of what you now know to be your Lyme disease. Um, let's see. I, I was working a lot on social media stuff. I'd have a lot of brand partnerships. I do a lot of photo shoots. I would always stay busy. Then all of a sudden I just felt, I just started canceling things like, Oh, I, f I feel so lazy. Like, Oh, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't feel well. I feel so lazy. I don't know why I just don't feel like it today. So I, I started, um, cutting down, cutting down things that I would do and lighten my schedule a lot more. Um, and I think it really started with the fatigue and then it started with stomach issues. Um, so now, Chris, you shared with us that you were very busy, right? You were, I think you had, if you had two ends of your candle, you were probably burning on, on eight ends, right? I mean, you were just a very, very busy person doing a lot of different things. Um, yeah. when you first started to feel this fatigue, did you believe it? Did you believe that you were overworking yourself or did you believe that it was something else going on? I... I didn't know. I'm like, okay, you know, I was trying to, I'm like, oh, I'm 20, however I was, however old I was then, like late 20s. Like, I feel like too young to be this, feel this old. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening. I just thought like, oh, I'm a, you know, my star sign's a Taurus. So I'm like, oh, I'm just kind of lazy, I guess. I, I didn't know. I didn't really didn't know what was happening. But then I started having other things like uh, stomach issues. Like everything I ate would start a war in my stomach. And I didn't think that was normal either because it, it was it was new. So, Crystal, when did you first start to see doctors to help you to define what was causing your health issues, your fatigue? And it seems like it was very severe fatigue and your stomach issues. Uh, I saw a doctor for a stomach, the stomach issues, because I didn't know what doctor to go to for, for fatigue. Like I, I didn't know. So I went to a, a stomach doctor and he prescribed me some antibiotics for, uh, gosh, I don't know, some kind of bacteria in the stomach, you know, and, it, and, and he said, if it, if it doesn't get better, then, then it's just, it, it's just stress or I don't know. I got some waste, waste basket diagnosis. We, we call it. Uh, so then I, so then I was sent to a more holistic doctor, a holistic gastrointestinologist like named uh, Dr. Rabar. And that was in Los Angeles. And he started me on all the tests. Um, 
every <laughs> like bodily anything that someone can test uh, he, he gave me. And he also asked me at the time if I'd ever been tested for Lyme disease. And I said, no, I didn't know what that was. And he said, well, the test is $1,500 at that time. I think it's a lot more affordable now, but it was $1,500 and you know, it would rule out having Lyme disease. And I asked how you get it. And he said, it's from ticks. And you know, I said, I'm not around a tick. I grew up in Southern California, you know, on the beach, there's no ticks. I don't, I've never seen a tick in my life. And um, so, so let's pause that. Let's pause that for a second. Because <laughs> I think that's an important, that's an important part of your journey, but it's also important that we share that with everyone. So, um, so you were, you were approximately 29 years old when you had gotten your early symptoms and you finally got a diagnosis somewhere in the neighborhood when you were 35. So there Gosh, was a, no, it was, uh, it was in 2015. So, um, I don't know how, yeah, so you, yeah, so <laughs> see, like, the, yeah. I'm like, I can't even brain fog still. Um, so, yeah, so you're about, you're, you were, you were probably, you were probably, um, oh no, I'm sorry. You're 35 now. So 35. I 35, right, I was, I was late twenties somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, mine, I it was in 2015, very late 2015, early 2016. Um, so how long was it between the time that you first started showing your symptoms and you finally got your Lyme disease diagnosis? Let's, let's, let's look at that. Okay. One. So that would be, uh, the symptoms were in around October, 2015. And then the official diagnosis was in January, 2016. Okay. So before you got your diagnosis, you met with a doctor who suggested that perhaps you should be looking at Lyme disease. You had this waste paper basket type of diagnosis where you had really a nothing diagnosis despite having all these symptoms. So you were believed to be sick, but they didn't know why. The doctor said, hey, we should test you for Lyme disease. And your response was, why would I be tested for Lyme disease? <laughs> yeah. There's no Lyme disease here, right? Yeah. And, and it's not as if, Crystal, you didn't have resources, right? If the $1,500 was, wasn't going to break the bank for you, you just decided that you weren't going to take the test because you just didn't think there was any possibility that someone who had lived the life that you had lived, born in Arizona, raised in the UK, <laughs> living in San Diego, then in, in Los Angeles, that you would have ever been around ticks, correct? Correct. And, and there was nothing that you had ever learned during any time in your educational experience nor did you ever learn anything while you were training in this entertainment world that you were living in. I mean, you were getting your, you were getting your MBA by watching some of the most brilliant, um, you know, business professionals in the world. Nothing ever came to you that led you to believe that perhaps you had come in contact with a tick that could have caused you to suffer Lyme disease. Not at all. I'd never, ever heard of checking for ticks or ticks or preventing ticks, you know, I'm nothing. Now, what was the doctor's response to you when he said to you, hey, you know, you have this waste, paste, waste, waste basket set of diagnoses. We've put you through a whole battery of tests. We don't really know what's wrong with you. We want you to take the Lyme disease test. You say no. What did he say to you? Like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll go do all these other tests. We'll run these other tests, which were, all, which were all expensive as well. You know, it's like the pee test, the poop test, the blood test, the spit tests. Um, and so he ran all of those and, you know, found all different things wrong. The adrenals were failing, um, the hormones were failing, the thyroid was fa failing. Um, gosh, I mean, I laugh now, but back then it's like, are you serious? Like, how could this many things be wrong? Um, Gosh, and then SIBO, but, uh, the bacteria overgrowth in the stomach, leaky gut, it all came back. And then he said, you know, all of these are pretty much Lyme disease symptoms. Can we test you for it? You know, now will you do it? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure. So I tested for Lyme disease and, you know, started on all the supplements that they gave me. Then the Lyme disease, it came back positive with uh, Lyme, Bartonella and Babesia. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like now I, now I know what I have. It's Lyme disease. You know? And then I'm thinking, all right, what, which, which medicine is he going to give me? You know, just thinking he was going to hand me a prescription, but instead he handed me a referral for a doctor, a different doctor. 
just to be clear, because I think from from doing our research and, and, and our chat offline, it sounds like you first saw a regular gastrointestinal doctor who is the one who gave you your first waste bas waste basket diagnosis. And then you went to a more holistic doctor who recommended the hygienic test, correct? Yes. And then your holistic doctor is one who diagnosed you and then still referred you to another specialist, even though they were a holistic doctor who probably is more well-versed in Lyme than traditional doctors. Yes, yes. He, he referred me to um, a, a woman in Beverly Hills, Dr. Lehman. So, um, so I thought, okay, this must be, this might be kind of serious if he's not just giving me a medication, he's sending me to a whole different specialist. And that's when it kind of, you know, I got this sinking feeling because most of my life, anything that happens to me, you just take medicine and it goes away, you know, anything uh, cold or, you know, I, random things like I've had like a couple of urinary tract things, you just take a medicine and you're done. And I, this is the first time that anything like this had ever happened to me where, where I'm like, okay, this is serious that there's like this special doctor for it. Crystal, talk to us about the system-wide failures you were referring to earlier. So you mentioned that you had all kinds of things going on, like your adrenals were failing and, and a lot of other things in your body. What kind of symptoms were you exhibiting as your, your disease progressed? You know, give us an idea of the types of neurological and physiological symptoms you were experiencing. Oh my gosh, I guess um, I actually have a list. Is that, I'll just read it off if that's okay. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I remember just writing down... Uh, Let's see, health, current symptoms, zaps in brain, clicking in wrist, popping bones, joint pain, tendon pain, bladder pain, bone pain in the ankles, hot vein, rush feeling in my back, just would feel like my whole back's on fire, heart palpitations, night sweats, can't regulate body temperature, neck stiffness, mood swings, depression, food allergies, weight loss, hair loss, severe fatigue, muscle spasms, balance issues, vertigo, jumpy, anxious. So it sounds like your Lyme disease progressed so bad that it actually was in your heart, meaning you have Lyme carditis with the heart palpitations, yeah. that you had neurological Lyme, it was in your brain as well, and it caused you to have POTS or dis, dis, uh, dis I can't pronounce the word, but POTS, where you're having yeah. all kinds of your uh, symptoms going on, like where you can faint and get dizzy and things like that. So no doctor prior to your holistic doctor ever thought Lyme disease with all these really common Lyme symptoms that you had? No, I, you know, I, you know, like... A lot of people say most doctors don't know much about it, it seems. And then so, you just feel like you're here. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> I'm obviously sick. You know, that's where a lot of people get it. It's in your head. You know, and you're just like, I can't, like gravity is way heavier. Something is not in my head. <laughs> but that's a good question, Crystal. Did you ever believe that possibly this was all psychological? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm stressed out. You know, I'm kind of trapped here at the mansion. You know, it's kind of, you know, I'm not really living life on my own terms completely. Like maybe it's just stress. Maybe uh, you know, it's all catching up to me. You know, you start convincing yourself what other people have told you. And do you think you ever gaslit by your doctors, meaning that they were the ones kind of encouraging you to think that it was more psychological and not physical? Oh, definitely. Definitely gaslit. So, Thankfully, you, you were referred to Dr. Lehman, who is a specialist in California that we are aware of. Talk to us about what that doctor's visit was like compared to what you would expect a normal doctor's visit to be like, you know, prior to that. Well, the doctor's visit with Dr. Lehman seemed like she knew exactly what to do and what she was doing. Uh, I immediately was started on antibiotics, maybe like five different kinds. One was bicillin that was injected directly in, and then the other ones were oral. Um, then she gave me different medications to help with any, any symptoms that the antibiotics created. And then I, she gave me thyroid, you know, pig thyroid medication, uh, creams. I was rubbing testosterone, progesterone, um, stuff for the adrenals, so many different supplements, like 40 different uh, you know, when I first started researching Lyme disease, I would see all these people with like supplements everywhere. I'm like, wow, that's, you know, that's excessive. And that's because I had, had no idea, just like most people don't, but I'm like, oh, okay, this is normal. This is, I'm right here with these people. Um, the worst I ever felt was when I started treatment and I th thought I'm, cause I, I guess it makes you worse. The Herxing, it makes you worse before you get better. So the worst I ever felt 
I remember thinking, okay, you know, it's been a great life. I've had, a, <laughs> I've had a lot of fun. Maybe, you know, a lot of stuff happened to me early in life because this was coming up. And, you know, I remember thinking at the end was happening that my whole body was failing me, that there, there was no way I was going to pull out of it. And, um, and, but I did. Uh, at the time, I also had breast implants, which some people with Lyme disease do. And I remember calling Lu Jean Fang, who I know took out Yolanda Foster's implants. I'm like, okay, she's got to be good at it. And she's, and I remember calling the office crying, like, I'm, I'm dying. I'm going to die if, if you don't, if I don't get these implants out. Um, Cause you know, this bacteria overload and then your immune system's constantly fighting these foreign objects in your body. And I remember Dr. Lehman saying, if you don't take the implants out, you're never going to get fully better because your immune system has something else to like, is working on fighting something else as well. Um, so that was probably what the, to the beginning of 2016 when I started treatment to June 16 was probably the hardest six months of my life. Um, but once I got the implants taken out and Lu Jing Feng was so, so careful. And she was saying that she has open heart surgery tools that she like makes sure to like scrape it all off the chest wall. And she just makes sure to get everything out, rebuild the muscle. I, I was in there for five hours. And when I came out, you know, I just felt like lighter. My lungs felt like twice as big and I was, I felt so much better. And I'm like, okay, if I can feel so much better from this, maybe, you know, as, as I continue, I'll only get better from here. So. So Chris, I want to I want to just backtrack a little bit there. So when you first saw Dr. Lehman and you treated aggressively with the wide variety of antibiotics and other supplements to boost a lot of other systems in your body, you mentioned that you had a really bad Herxheimer reaction and you literally thought you were going to die at that point. Now, were you warned that that was going to happen from the aggressive treatment protocol that you were given? Yes, I was definitely warned that as the bugs die off, you know, you're going to piss them off and, you know, you might get worse. And she gave me certain things for herxing and, okay, stop this if it gets really bad. So I just, um, she gave me Alka-Seltzer Gold, which really helped the sodium bicarbonate really helped the herxing. And um, I forget exactly what else, uh, but, but that, so cause it was a while ago and I've, I've been treating since then. So, um, yeah, herxing is so weird, and <laughs> again, something that was completely new to me. So I wonder, Crystal, if you're, as you were killing the bacteria, if you were sort of at a disadvantage compared to somebody else because you were having toxin die off from the bacteria dying from Lyme and co-infections that you had, the Bartonella and the Babesia, plus you had these toxic bags in you too that were probably filled with mold and all kinds of toxins that your body was attacking. So do you think that you you really just weren't able to receive the, the treatment properly with Dr. Lehman because of the breast implants. And that really you weren't going to make any progress at all until you got them removed. Uh, completely hundred percent. Like I didn't think I could get all the way better until the implants were removed. And I, and you know, I see people today that are really sick and posting on social media and, and you know, the women do have implants and it's like, you know, I don't want to be the one to, you know, tell people what to do with their lives, but I, I it really helped me to, it was like that next step to get them taken out. But also where I was living inside the Playboy Mansion, I found lots of mold there because Dr. Lehman said I should test where I live. And, you know, it was owned by the company at that point. And I just thought, okay, if I ask the company to do it, maybe it'll be like hidden from me. So I hired somebody Dr. Lehman recommended and he came over and he like went in all the vents and everywhere. He was amazing. And he found fungus mold. Uh, the mantua was mostly built out of concrete, which is kind of rare. Usually it's wood, but mold all through to the concrete. Um, it ended up being a two and a half million dollar mold remediation uh, on, you know, Playboy paid for. Um, so no, Crystal, <laughs> I had it all. <laughs> again, it sounds like you had all the cards stacked against you, unfortunately, where you had yeah. you had various co-infections, you had mold exposure, you had toxic breast implants. Now, was Dr. Lehman recognizing that you were having all these toxins going on and giving you things like binders and, and supportive detox tools to at least support your body until you can get the breast implants removed? Yes, I, I 
was taking a lot of binders. I take cholestyramine. I took, um, you know, now I think it's different. Like, okay, maybe that one doesn't work. Char lots of charcoal. Uh, I forget what other binders, but you know, it's, it's hard I, I, around that time. It's almost like, you know, you're kind of a guinea pig, like, okay, does this going to work for you? Okay. It's not try this one or well call. I remember being given that for the mold, but it was just, it's crazy how the perfect storm could happen. You just have no idea that it's coming. And before we, before we get back to the breast implants, was there anything that helped you at all? That's noteworthy for our listeners that gave you some sort of relief before the explant surgery? Gosh. And the only thing that really I could have really done during that time is just kind of, I deactivated all my social media. You know, I didn't want to feel like I had to keep up with anything. You know, I tried to make my life as simple as possible, uh, do things that I enjoyed that I could, that I could do even just being outside, you know, when the sun was nice, you know, when you're that sick, it's really hard. So it's just the little things, I guess. Okay, so let's talk about the breast implants. So when did you get the breast implants? I got the breast implants in, oh man, 2007 or six. Uh, I, I remember that it, I had them around eight years by that point. And every single year after I had the implants in, I would get these surveys in the mail and they would, you know, oh, we'll pay you $25 if you like to. And I would just do the survey anyway, like everything's going great. Like, how do you feel? Great, fatigue. No. And I didn't think anything of the surveys. And I, I took them for maybe five years in a row, six years in a row. Then they stopped coming. And then I got sick. I'm like, oh, I wish I could rewind and... <laughs> You know, oh, this is going to be like miserable coming up. But, you know, now this pork allergan was the company that made them. But now this company has these records of patients that say everything's fine. But where were the surveys for years six, seven, eight? I don't know. So, so Crystal, before you had the implants installed, um, did anybody ever give you a warning that perhaps having the implants put in could cause you to suffer uh, immune disruption? Absolutely not. Nobody told me any of that. So, you, so I, I had no idea. But thinking back now, now that you know you learn, you learn and you realize, okay, the, the thing you're putting in your body isn't of the earth. It isn't natural. It isn't, uh, it's silicone. It's ingredients like talc, formaldehyde. Yeah, you're gonna get sick. And, but until, until you had a sort of a combination of events, you were doing okay with the breast implants, meaning you didn't feel anything after they had gotten put in and you were taking surveys over a regular period of time. And every time you answered the questions on the survey, you were feeling okay. So you were young and you were healthy and your body was able to manage the breast, breast implants until they couldn't, right? Exactly. Now, when do you think, and, I, and, and we did in our research, we, we think that you think you were probably bitten by a tick at some particular time in your life. So when do you think that took place? Is that before or after you had the breast implants? Um, I, I like, you know, for years I've been like racking my brain, like, okay, still, I remember I used to go hiking in the Malibu mountains, uh, a hike called Temescal Canyon. And it takes about an hour and you go through trees and you don't think anything of it. You. I remember I had a trainer and I would work out and they're like, oh, so I can see what you're doing. Do wear like crop pants. So I would wear the crop pants and then the low socks. So, you know, my legs are, are showing. And so I'm brushing against, so, so I'm thinking maybe on the hike, maybe in, in around 2008, um, 2000, end of 2008 or 2009, you know, maybe I remember, cause, cause like, am I, did I remember this? Or am I just making it up to try and, but like, maybe I re remember something that was like, I had to pick it off, um, like small, like a poppy seed, but I, I never remember a tick. I never remember a rash. And I don't know if, if like, maybe there was something I'm just, because people say it can't be, you know, transmitted other ways, but then some people say they can, so. Yeah, there, there's certainly some debate in the community about whether or not uh, sexual transmission is 
um, is a way of, of ultimately transmitting Lyme disease. There are some leading doctors like Alan McDonald, for example, feel very strongly that it can be transmitted uh, sexually. And he cited recently some, some studies that have been done, at least in animal studies, where Lyme disease had been transmitted um, uh, sexually. And, and we know for sure that Lyme disease can be transmitted congenitally from mother to child and, and, and that the bacteria will pass through the, the placenta. So, you know, there are certainly many ways that someone can get Lyme disease, uh, but it's most likely from, from a tick bite. And of course we know it's hard to find ticks biting us, especially if we weren't aware of ticks and we were not checking for ticks and you certainly didn't think there were any ticks where you ever lived, right? So it's not like you were given any educational support to lead you to believe that you should be protecting yourself on hikes or checking yourself daily or, you know, and, and you're also somebody who, who also loves animals, right? And we know from our research that you're, um, you're an enthusiast about, uh, about pets and dogs in particular. And anyone who is coming in contact with dogs on a regular basis has a high probability that they're going to come in contact with ticks. I can actually hold one up. My dog Hazel had one last week. And, um, you know, oh, and, no. and so November in New York is still, um, still tick season because Hazel came in with a tick. And, um, you know, and, and we, we put this up on our Instagram to let people know that, uh, you know, you still have to be vigilant with your, with your, with your tick checks, which of course you weren't because you didn't think you can get, you can get, um, Lamsies. but you know, like, like so many people, Crystal, right. There is this gap in time between when you likely came in contact with the, uh, the germs that were spit into you by the bite and the time that you had gotten sick, right? So you were young, you were healthy, you were able to, you were able to manage, your body was able to manage the bacteria. You were even able to get implants in and your body could still manage it. But now we start to live a more stressful life, right? You're, you're living in a place where uh, your decisions are not your own, uh, that you, you're living in a very structured environment that you didn't necessarily uh, structure yourself. And now, of course, you find that there's, 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 $2 million of mold rem remediation that needs to be done, which of course is, is sort of like the, the, the whole world coming together of all the things that, you know, that, um, you know, could make you sick. You know, the mold is probably the most immunosuppressant experience that you could have had. And then you crash, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely crash. So talk to us about what it was like to work with Dr. Lehman and what types of things was she having you do so that you could, you could begin to manage this very difficult uh, disease that you were diagnosed with? Um, from what I remember, for about a year, I was on maybe six different antibiotics at once uh, for six weeks at a time. And then I do like a two week break and then do, do different ones for six more weeks, do a two week break. And that went on for about a year. And at the end of it, I felt a little bit, a little bit better, but, um, but maybe that's because I was you know, dousing myself in all this stuff and taking the adrenal and the creams and the thyroid, but it, I definitely was still sick after a year. And Dr. Lehman recommended that I do, the next step was the port um, so that I could start having the antibiotics intravenously. And at that time I thought, okay, there's gotta be something else where I don't have to have the port. There's gotta be something else. And around that time, there was a new stem cell clinic that's in Germany and was coming to Beverly Hills called Infusio. And I decided to, I heard that Yolanda Foster or Hadid or, you know, whatever, whatever her last name is these days, she went to Impusio and so I just thought I'd give it a try. I looked up other stories. I know, I think Kelly Osborne went around the same time or a little bit before. Uh, so I decided to try stem cells. So Crystal, I'm curious to hear, what do you think gave you better symptom relief? Do you think it was the explant surgery? Cause you mentioned you had almost an immediate relief of some of your symptoms after that. But then you did a one-year treatment with Dr. Lehman again afterwards, and you mentioned you had just some symptom relief there. So what was better for you, the explant surgery or the one year of aggressive antibiotic treatment with Dr. Lehman? I think it was a combination of both. I think it was a combination of taking down a lot of the bacteria load with antibiotics with Lehman, and then taking out the toxic bags so that my immune system could work better to fight the, the bad bugs. You did mention, Crystal, earlier that you, you had to sort of surround yourself around things that made you happy, cut off social media so you wouldn't be stressed, and, and live a very simple life to heal. So what role do you feel 
your mental health and stress and the mind plays in healing from Lyme disease? Oh my gosh, I think, I think the mind can work you up in so many ways and you know, you don't feel well and then you like make it worse in your mind and, and then stresses out your entire body and keeps you sick. So I, I definitely think trying to calm the mind and have less stress boosts your immune system and, and helps it work for you. Uh, you know, instead of panicking about every little thing, I just kind of gave in and trusted that I would get better. And, you know, eventually I did. Many, many people, Crystal, don't realize, especially that early on, how important it is to try to live a low stress life while healing. And that was one of the first things I think you mentioned you did. So that, I think that really helped you put yourself in a position to be primed for healing. And then getting the explant surgery was another major step. And then obviously prepping your body with Lehman with all of the, the immuno support and, and the antimicrobial support was another key step, but you weren't getting to where you wanted to be. So you found stem cells. It sounds like you found Infusio in California. And they also obviously had a location in Germany as well. Yeah. And you decided to look into stem cells, but stem cells can be really scary, right? I mean, I looked into them many years ago as well. So talk to us about your research and how you decided to move forward despite the, you know, the potential kind of creepiness of them, to be honest. Yeah, I, at first I had no idea, but I, thinking back to what we just talked about, about things I did to help, so I just wanted to touch on this really quick. I think diet was really important, like changing my diet. And also, you know, I, I reevaluated all the people in my life. I'm like, who actually cares about me? Who actually, you know, loves me? Who, you know where is it like reciprocal and so i i think i narrowed down my friends uh, and then the diet you know all that stuff was was while i was treating with lehman so i think diet really 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 helped i i that was the first time that i ever learned like okay sugar feeds all the bad bacteria gluten causes inflammation you know that also really, really helped. I just wanted to. <laughs> no, no. And thank you, Crystal. And I have a couple of follow-ups for that. So you, you mentioned obviously sugar feeds the bugs or the bacteria and gluten can be really bad for the inflammation. Now, some people that we have talked with, it's, it's sort of a, I guess, a controversial topic. Some people feel that sometimes you have to feed the bugs or you have to just have sugar and give in. And, you know, some people feel very strongly about that, about that topic. And other people feel that it's really bad to do that. So where do you land in that debate of sometimes you have to just say, you know what, I'm going to have a, a cheat day and I'm going to eat all the sugar in the world. Do you think that's something that's healthy for somebody that's going through a healing journey or something that you, you caution against? I would caution against, well, just from my own personal story, you know, I was so weak. So if I had anything with sugar, I would feel hungover the next day, almost like I was out all night drinking or something, you know, and I didn't drink. So, because I'm like, okay, if I'm, my body's really sick and sensitive and sugar really affects it this way, when I feel better, it still affects it. I just don't notice as much. So I, I try, it's like a, a lot of these people that are healthy and they had the standard American diet and, you know, oh, I'm fine. I'm healthy. Well, it catches up. And I, and I, I believe that with sugar, I believe that it's, you know, it's not good for us. It's not normal. I try and I try and go back to like the simplest of living and it's like, okay, would we eat sugar every day? Probably not. We'd go find other things. Many people we talk to and you're our 226th guest, I believe that we have wow. interviewed on our podcast or to be precise, actually 225 to be precise. Wow. So a lot of people we talk to Crystal tell us that when they first get diagnosed, they really struggle with having a more simple life, meaning low stress, low stimuli to heal. And that actually makes them psychologically or mentally more stressed, but you embrace that. So do you think that your studies in psychology helped you to understand why that was so important in your healing journey and you had a leg up compared to others in the community in that regard? I hope so. I hope so. I think I was just following what was making me feel better mentally, spiritually. You know, I was just I'm like, okay, this feels right. This feels like the right way to go. And I just, I just kept following that and listening to that, I guess the intuition kicked in. You also mentioned that you, you chose to cut out friends from your life that were causing you stress and that weren't really a good fit for you while you were healing. And again, we hear the opposite from a lot of people where they have a hard time letting go of toxic friends and their friends really gaslight them and abuse them. And they keep going back and trying to maintain these relationships. But you were the one who said, nope, I'm not going to have that, which again was a really positive step in your healing journey. What gave you that strength and knowledge to know you had to do that? and really cut out those toxic relationships in order to heal. Well, I think it's really hard to keep them because 
not only are you like having to convince and tell yourself all these things that you're having to convince and tell everybody else, you know, that you're really sick or you really just need somebody to be there. Or you really, you can tell when you talk to someone and then they don't really believe you like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so it's like, okay. Those, I just need to get these people clear out because this is really happening right now. And you know, it's all for the better. And I hope people can get rid of toxic people. It, it makes you lighter <laughs> and uh, definitely, definitely helps you heal. And Crystal, I think that's really important advice. And many people in the Lyme community are people pleasers and they feel like they're failing their friends and they keep trying to latch on. So I think that this is really good advice you're giving people that are listening to this podcast. But on the other side, how do the people that you cut out of your life react to you saying, basically, I'm done? I think I couldn't worry about it. I really couldn't. Um, I just, I just had to move on and not worry about it. And just, you know, not really, because I think if you just, a lot of times you have to be selfish, especially when you're really sick and do things for yourself. Otherwise you're just like in this mental downward spiral and you're the whole point in trying to heal is to go up. So I definitely think you just can't, you just can't worry about it. And, and I, and I'm a people pleaser and it's like, I was at the mansion with half and making sure he was okay and everything's great. And I, you know, completely lost myself. So I had to like do a 180. <laughs> I had no other choice. Crystal, did Dr. Lehman have you on anything for your nervous system? Because many of us get stuck in fight or flight, which is a common reaction to Lyme disease. Were you working on your nervous system prior to stem cells as well? I wasn't working on it prior. She did recommend, you know, certain things. Um, I, I remember I did take some CBD. I remember, you know, she recommended Annie Hopper, the, the program, DNRS. DNRS, which I'm only to this day starting. So, you know, it was, it's so much. Sometimes you're just like, okay, I give up. I need a break, <laughs> but I'm, I, you know, I'm just starting Annie Hopper now. So let's go back to the stem cells. So they kind of reminded you of a science experiment, cloning or artificial intelligence. And I had the same reaction when I started to research them too, when I was really sick. So what allowed you to overcome those fears of stem cells and the newness of stem cells to actually move forward with stem cell therapy? Well, when I very first thought of stem cells, you know, you, you don't have any ideas. So I'm like, oh, is it like cloning? Do people end up with like two heads? Like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the research I did, I just, tried my best to you know make good judgment um other success stories from people i think i read something about mel gibson's dad was like you know went to panama and was so much better and it gets rid of all the inflammation and so i thought okay well at least i can maybe heal from all this you know the, the antibiotics kills all the good bacteria as well maybe it can repair something and and that was my only choice really at the time this is the only thing that could possibly help me. And so I signed up, paid, you know, I think it was $25,000 at the time, which, you know, I know it's really steep. And um, it was like a two week, you know, they load you with it, kind of different bags of stuff to optimize for the stem cells. Uh, then I had the procedure. I think the doctor there was learning at the time. So, you know, <laughs> during the procedure, there were some little parts that weren't numb but it all ended up being worth it. You know, I had to sign a waiver, like if you get cancer or whatever in five years, you know, don't come back to us. But I signed it all. Um, I met one of my dearest friends. I think you guys had her on, uh, Erica Schlick. Yes, <laughs> we love she's, Erica. She's such a good, like a pioneer for everything. She's amazing. Um, but it definitely changed my life and made me feel semi-normal. I'm still not normal back to normal. Like, you know, I dream about the times when- <laughs> so Are any of us normal? Let's be real. Come on. I know. <laughs> Just trying to get as close as I can, but <laughs> um, yeah, it really, really helped me. They said in a hundred days, you'll get better. Like in three months, something like that. It was like 90 to 100 days. So I got the stem cells. I remember the you wait there, they take it out, you wait in the waiting room for it, it takes like an hour and then they bring it in and put it in an IV. They're like, here's all your stem cells and put it back in. I remember that day feeling like high in my body, just so happy and high and I'm like, whoa, this is cool. Is this what like normal people feel like? It felt like better than normal. Um, but then I kind of went back to the same, same kind of thing and I'm waiting one month, two months, three months, 100 days still not better. I'm like, oh man, what a waste. Uh, and it, 
I just went along just hoping. And then around month nine, the symptoms just started melting away. I just almost like kind of forgot about it. I'm like, oh, I had an ice cream and it did nothing. And like, whoa, it was, uh, it was amazing. It was, it definitely helped me more than anything else. So I think the, the lesson here is patience. And it sounds like it, at first you were getting anxious that you weren't going to get better, but at, at about the nine month mark, you were like, wow, this is really becoming a, a game changer. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And then around a little while after that, half, you know, half passed away and um, that was hard because I was sick and, and then he got unexpectedly sick and that was really hard. And, you know, he passed away. I couldn't leave the house for so long. And my friend was like, let's, you know, let's go to, let's go travel somewhere. Just let's go to Africa. So, so I'm like, while I'm feeling okay, I'm going to do as much as I can. So I started traveling and I haven't really stopped. So Crystal, I love the fact that you're a travel blogger and Rich is going to talk to you about that in a second, but you just made a comment that you said, while I'm feeling better, I want to do what I can. Did you have beliefs then that you were going to get really sick again? Absolutely. I thought it was temporary, definitely temporary. My, okay, this is while I'm as good as it's going to get, you know, I wasn't a hundred percent, but while it's as good as it's going to get, I'm going to do as much as I can. Cause while I was sick, I couldn't do anything. I could barely even lift my arms. I could barely walk. It's like fire down my back. And barely, I remember I love Disneyland. And one day I had to be in a wheelchair in Disneyland cause I just couldn't walk. Like it just, everything would tweak out of place and, you know, be so exhausting. But luckily things would tweak and I'd sleep and wake back up and it would kind of repair itself overnight, but it's, it's just so weird. Like Lyme is so, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I definitely thought it was temporary. Okay, so it sounds like you got back to maybe 80, 90% of your pre-illness health from the stem cells. Is that, is that an accurate assessment? Yes. And has that maintained itself since you've gotten the stem cells? Has that been a pretty, a pretty level set or have you had any sort of setbacks since then? Mm, setbacks, but not as not as bad as, you know, I'm thinking about doing maybe doing it again. It's no, it's nowhere near as, as um, bad as it was. Like I know what it is to, you know, what it's like to, you know, be a person with Lyme disease at the very worst, and I know what it is like now having it and, you know, being able to still do things. But, you know, I post all these travels and all these Instagram things, but that's only a small percentage of the time. Most of the time, I'm, I haven't left my house in five days, so <laughs> it's um. No, definitely not you know a lot now i think is in my mind it's like i think a lot of the neurological lime you know i still have weird symptoms like whooshing or like zaps or waking up in the middle of the night like in a panic not knowing where i am and you know I, that's when I, i'm starting the annie hopper and maybe that will help a little bit so crystal when you have these setbacks it sounds like you're and obviously they're not nearly as bad as it was when you were pretty much at your worst when you could, couldn't even lift your arms as you described it are you doing anything or treating with anybody to help address these setbacks or are you just sort of doing natural stuff to kind of bounce back? Well, the doctor I'm with now is Dr. Horowitz in New York and, you know, I'm in LA. So he just kind of helps me by phone. And sometimes if I'm there, I see him, but we, we did another treatment and I told him like, I really don't want to take antibiotics. So I tried the, the Dapsone or what is it? No, Dysol Dapsone. Oh, Disulfram. Yes. Yeah. The Disulfram. And, um, and that the herxing there was probably one of the worst I've ever had. But um, how long were you on that for, Crystal? Um, a few weeks. But he said, you know, it's it's strong. Just start small. Or start, you know, really tiny little dose once a week, and then kind of move it up. But I'm like, I'm gonna kick its ass. And I, you know, I, I did, you know, and day five, I'm like, oh, I got hit by a truck. And then after that, I started having like almost like psychosis. So I had to stop. But um, but the day I stopped, I felt great. Uh, you know, if I do it again, I think I'll just do the smaller doses. Um, but you know, I'm so I'm so much, I'm much better. But I think it take took a whole life change. So, so disulfiram is it something looking back that you would still do, knowing knowing what you went through, was something you'd recommend? It's something I definitely recommend. I think it works uh, well. I would recommend it, but I would recommend very, very tiny, tiny dose, like work yourself up very slowly, like even slower than the doctor told me. You mentioned psychosis, Crystal, and that is a, 
that is a side effect or a known symptom of taking disulfiram too aggressively. So it sounds like you may have taken it too hard, too fast, right? And then gotten the, the psychosis, but it was effective in treating your, your symptoms. So I think that's a good, a good warning that you're, you're giving to our listeners here. Yeah. Now, I do want to follow up because I do know that you, you recently, just this year, probably a couple of months ago, got diagnosed with this long QT syndrome, which is a heart condition. Is that correct? Yes. Now, we actually interviewed Colonel Nicole Malakowski about two months ago, who is a brilliant, brilliant advocate in the community. And she told us that she was diagnosed with long QT syndrome as well. And it's actually caused from Lyme disease. So have, have you discussed wow. that with your doctors, that long QT is actually a consequence or, or a result of having severe Lyme disease? Wow, that, that's really interesting. Um, you know, when I would, on different... Um, I don't know what's it called when they like scan your heart. <laughs> the, oh, the EK, uh, the EKG? EK, EKG or yeah, sometimes they call it EKC. I don't know. But um, yeah, they would say, oh, you have long QT, you have long QT. Before I was with Dr. Horowitz, he, um, he you know, gave me, gave me that and said, oh, you have long QT. There's certain medications we can't give you. Um, and then I had, I went to Florida and I was going to get this EBO2 procedure where it's like the, the plate yes. I what it's called, regenerative something in Florida. Well, when they pulled the blood out, when it was getting cleaned, I fainted. I ended up going to the ER. I didn't end up having the treatment, but in the ER, they're like, oh, you have this long QT, you better check it out. So I went to, I went back to LA, saw a professional here for long QT, like, oh, you have this long QT. It, it was really scary. And when I researched it, it said that you, you only live 10 years if you have it. And it was like, oh my gosh, now this, like what? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to find the number one specialist for this, like in the country. And I found Michael Ackerman and he's at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So I went there and did all the tests. And he said, be careful of all the medications for long QT. I see that you have long QT, but it's not as severe or it's not doesn't follow the same format as regular long QT. And what he thinks happened is that I have this, like a lot of people have this genetic heart marker that is nothing. It's called KC and something. It doesn't affect anybody really, but because of the aggressive Lyme treatment and the antibiotics, it triggered it into long QT. So that's what he told me happened. So now I have to you know, check the website every time I'm about to take medications called crediblemeds.org. And when I look up what you can't take with this, with the long QT, Cipro is on it, uh, Z-Pack, you know, a lot of, and I was taking Cipro for six weeks and I would take Cipro younger for urinary tract things. Um, you know, Cipro is a whole nother thing because I think I have like permanent nerve damage from taking Cipro. Uh, but a lot of those antibiotics trigger the, the long QT. And I think a lot of Lyme patients take a lot of antibiotics that um, can trigger the long QT for sure. Yeah, we actually found Crystal on the CDC website and we can send you the link where it was discussing how the Lyme bacteria itself can cause or activate the long QT, but also as you noted, a lot of the treatments too, right? A lot of the antibiotics can also trigger it. So it's the question, what, you know, is it chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. Which one caused it, the treatment or the Lyme? Yeah. Did the Lyme cause it in me? Did the, I don't know, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it sucks. And I, you know, I feel so bad for anyone that has to go through this because, you know, life is hard and scary and all those things without any of this. So it's, it's really, you know, it's really unfortunate. So with Dr. Horowitz, and since you finished the, the stem cell therapy, has there been anything else you've done that's been noteworthy to share with our listeners? It's been helpful in your healing journey or even with battling a flare or just having a good quality of life? I think I have to continue to keep things simple. Um, I have to try and do more things that I really like and um, try not to stress out too much. You know, I know I know a lot of things can trigger, like even hot showers can make, you know, it's like tiring. So I, you put the water down to more of a lukewarm and um, I did have a infrared sauna. You know, I try, I try and move, I try and, go on walks. I try and exercise because for some reason, for some reason, I feel like if I'm moving and if I'm, it's shifting around and maybe helping getting some toxins out or maybe helping me feel better. But I definitely think it's, it's hard because it's like exercise, but then a lot of people can't. So 
know, even just like a little walk or being out in the sun. Um, yeah, so, I just try not to get overwhelmed. I try not to stress about anything. <laughs> and I think that's such an important lesson and it's so simple, but I, honestly, I forget it all the time. Try not to be overwhelmed. You know, try to keep life simple. When you're stressed, we know your body releases cortisol, which prevents your body from healing. So but talk to us about the exercise part of it or the movement, because as you, as you noted, many people in the Lyme community have exercise intolerances. And, you know, how do you balance the movement that you know is so necessary to maintain your level of health, but also not overdoing it so you're not, you know, sitting in bed for, you know, two weeks because you put, you push your body too hard. Yeah. I mean, when I was at that stage, I think stretching, even just stretching, if you're not just trying to stretch a little bit, you know, I would put yoga on YouTube and kind of follow along as best I could. And, you know, I think that helps to get things kind of moving, you know, it's like, I would have like a stiff neck for so long, but then if I just try to like move, it would go away faster. So things like that, things like that, I think. So Crystal, my final question before Rich takes it back over is give us an idea as to how much you've healed from since you've been at your worst. You kind of gave us a glimpse when you're at your worst, you couldn't lift your arms, you were being pushed around in a wheelchair. What are you doing today? I mean, no, you know, obviously we follow you on social media, so we see all the amazing things you've been doing these past few months, and we're so jealous of all, all your awesome <laughs> activities and, and admiring from a distance. So, but share with us, you know, some of the things you're doing now that you never dreamed of doing when you were at your worst. Oh my gosh, traveling. Um, you know, I just went to Egypt. You know, a lot of, before I'm like, okay, I can't really go too far in case something happens. I need to be near the doctors. But, you know, now I bring a little extra things in case I need it. I bring the Pedialyte and make sure I'm always hydrated. And, you know, I was in Egypt and the Maldives and, you know, going to more remote, more remote, remote places. And, you know, that was really fun. And, you know, it does look very active on social media, but there are days where it's like, okay, I just was in a hotel room, like for a few days doing absolutely nothing, just ordering, you know, room service. And so it's, it's just kind of a balance rest and uh, then have have fun while I can. So Crystal, I want to talk to you now about your journey of transformation, right? Um, and, and I guess the first question I want to ask you is, um, you said that your intuition told you you had to shed yourself of all this baggage that you had gathered. But I'm wondering, as you were gathering the baggage, whether it be toxic people or activity on social media or taking the responsibilities and the stresses that you were taking at the mansion and ultimately, uh, you know, uh, the, the breast implants, as you were going through that process of sort of picking up all of this um, unhealthy baggage, were you were your intuition speaking to you then? Were, were you were you were, was your gut telling you that you shouldn't have the breast implants. You shouldn't be uh, surrounding yourself with toxic people. You, you know, were, were you getting those signals early on and were you ignoring them or were you not getting the signals? Um, I think I was getting the signals and ignoring them. Um, you know, being at the mansion and having the implants and doing all the things everyone did at the mansion. And it's like, okay, this doesn't really feel like me. This, uh, you know, bleach blonde hair, everything fake, you know, it's, this doesn't feel like me. And it took getting sick to really change. So I think that was the blessing of getting sick is that I had the chance to really reevaluate my life and what's important. And, you know, some people it takes longer for them to do that if ever. So that was, that was the blessing that definitely came out of being sick. So we've had guests in the past tell us, uh, and they, uh, one of our guests actually calls that process of listening to your body, body confidence. So you're, you're getting signals and you're listening to them. And we've had actually some guests tell us that they've lost touch with their signals, that they lost touch with their feelings because of the illness and the gaslighting and the medical trauma and so many other things. But it sounds like you always kept in touch with your signals and you ignored them, but you knew that they were telling you what they were telling you. And finally, when you had gotten sick, it was, it was sort of Atlas throwing off the world from her shoulders. And now, and now you were in touch with your, and in tune with your body confidence and you were listening to your signals and you were doing all the things that your, that your intuition was telling you to do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think being at the mansion, like my inner voice got, you know, quietened and or, or shut off, but, you know, I ended up like fighting my way back to it. And, and I think, I think that's definitely the most important. 
certainly the most important part of your healing journey, right? If you didn't start listening, if you didn't start following what your body was telling you to do, you wouldn't have gotten any better. In fact, you thought you were going to die. And, and that's how that's how far along it had gotten with you ignoring what your what your body confidence was telling you to do. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about modeling, because that's another really important part of a journey, right? And it looks like you are modeling some of the people who were being vulnerable and open about their experience, specifically Yolanda Hadid or Yolanda Foster, whatever her name is, as you had said before <laughs> at this point, right? Uh, and on two, at least two different occasions, you followed her model. The first is you went to the same explant surgeon that she went to because that was an important part of her journey and it became a part of yours. And then you also went to the same clinic where she had gotten her she had gotten her, um, uh, or you had gotten uh, the the implants of the um, of the stem cells, right? Mm -hmm. So, so they were two of the largest turns in your journey, two of the most important parts of your journey, and you got that by modeling someone else who was very public and vulnerable about her experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, first, I'd like you to talk about modeling other people who have been successful, um, and secondly, I'd like you to talk to us about whether that inspired you to be as public as you have been and as vulnerable as you have been with your experiences. Um, it really helps to have somebody to model after for sure. It really helps to have somebody that's like, okay, I did this and it really worked because it, you know, it still was like a wild, wild west to me. You don't know. There's so many options of treatments you could do. So it really helped me. So I wanted to be that person in return, especially for removing implants because I thought, okay, here, here I am like, playboy married to Hugh Hefner and she's getting this completely taken out. She got sick. You really don't need this to be beautiful. And she's telling you which doctor she went to and all of her symptoms so that you could see if you, you know, have them too. Because when I first started on the journey of the breast implants, it was a comment on Instagram that was like, I think that's, you know, I had gone to Erica Lehman to ask her about that because I was getting these comments they're like oh it could be your implants could you ever never thought of it never thought of that and then I did a, you know that's when it, the conversation came up with Erica Lehman about you know yeah if you want to go all the way better you need to remove them so I was very very public about my journey because I knew it was something not me to begin with I knew it was something that I did under pressure or feeling like I'd you know be more loved or to get more attention or be more more of something and less of myself if i if i got them so i want people to know like hey you're good just as you are you don't need to do this if you do do this you could get really sick if you're already really sick this this is what you know you can do about it and ever since then i get so many women every day writing me thank you thank you so much you know i went to dr fang i went to this other doctor you know, I'm so much better. Thank you. And for me, that feels like purpose more than anything in my life before that I meant it more than anything at the mansion. So Chris, I'd like to end this podcast in the same way we began it by thanking you for being so public and being so vulnerable because you, you benefited from another person or some other people who were vulnerable and public about their experience. And because of that, you're, treatment journey and your healing journey was shortened. And now you're doing exactly the same thing by being public and vulnerable. So I, I can't thank you enough for being open and public and sharing so much with the community because you are shortening other people's journeys and you're making them have a much better life. So thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank, and thank you as well. You know, it's because, it's because of people like you that everyone, you know, it's, it's like everyone's getting on that train and I've been hearing things of, you know, new treatments or new options that are coming down the line and, you know, it's, it's, it's because of you and everyone's voices. It's, it's getting louder and it's, it's awesome. Thank you for listening to the Tick Boot Camp interview with our guest, Crystal Hefner. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Crystal Hefner, please visit our Instagram page at Crystal Hefner. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Boot Camp podcast, please share with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of our post. Third, Tick Boot Camp has created a Tick by Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please note we would appreciate any input or any improvements you would like to offer to us. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Boot Camp podcast. And finally, we thank you, our community, for your comments on our past podcast episodes. 
please take a minute to leave us an honest review on Apple Podcasts, on Instagram, or on our website. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews you share with us. Thank you, as always, for listening.